What's going on, everybody? And welcome back to the channel today. I'm excited to have author Caroline Hardacre with me today to talk about composite creatures. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, her YouTube channel, uh, Bookish Take. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about what parenting life is like, because I, I feel like, you know, you can just talk about that for days. But uh, Caroline, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> That's probably the way I've described myself since my baby was born. I'm okay. And yeah, I'm good. Um, it's like really miserable. You wouldn't think it's July. It's like really stormy outside, but what do you expect of the north of England? I guess. Yeah, no, it's it's the same here. I mean, I, I'm I'm in I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, uh in the yeah. US. So yeah, it's it's stormy here too. We literally, <sighs> I think we're supposed to have storms. It started middle of last week and it's supposed to continue through probably next week. Oh, I bet your uh, storms are more stormy than our storms. Our storms are just like drizzle. <laughs> yeah, but it's like it's like hard mist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no, we up. we we get you know like you know it'll thunder for a good 10, 15 minutes, and then it just wow. downpours for like five or ten, and then it's done, and it's just cloudy the rest of the day. <laughs> oh, it's that's much more dramatic than here. Yeah, our tolerance level is much lower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I like your I like your uh, response to I'm okay. I you know I feel like if you if you say that you're doing well or you're doing really good, people are like, are you sure? Because you yeah. know you've got a baby. Like, how can you be doing okay? <laughs> I know because you're you're trying to continue your life as well, and then yeah. you've got a, a, a baby, which in some cases is a lot more high needs than other babies, and some days are different to other days and I mean I'll talk about that a little bit later I'm talking about how writing is going and stuff um but yeah I'm okay <laughs> yeah. yeah you know uh we were talking a little bit earlier you know I'm I'm starting to realize that my my daughter she's 13 months now and she's walking around everywhere. she's kind of like a glorified cat right now because she likes to just like <laughs> knock everything off tables that's like yes. her that's her thing she has to pick it up and throw it on the floor or kind of like, like, and then you'll tell her, you know, no, don't do that. And she'll watch you and still do it. So I'm like, mm -hmm. are they like on the same level? Like they when they are. get this age? Oh my God. I've got a giant cat, like a big Maine Coon cat. And she's five now. And she, she's just like the, the beta for having a baby. She really is like, she's, I mean, I'll talk about that a little bit later. I'll talk about composite creatures, to be honest, because she's had a part in that for sure. But um, but yes, they, they've definitely got the same wavelength and mine too, just stare at each other constantly. Not not into touching yet, but they'll just stare. It's uh, quite intense. Yeah, know? yeah. She, Im Imma Kate, my daughter, is more into the touching part and the cat, uh, the cat just kind of like tolerates it. I'm like ready for just a popper, but she won't. She'll just kind of sit there and kind of like smack her in the face to like pet her, you know? <laughs> and then like, she'll just realize, okay, I've had enough and just scurry off. But I'm like, man, I'm just really hoping there's not a day where she just decides to just like, you know, snap, but it hasn't gotten there yet. No, and it sounds okay so far. So yeah. it sounds, sounds like they're at peace with one another. <laughs> so far. <laughs> until, yeah, you know, until the tail pulling happens, yeah. <laughs> oh God, yeah, it's inevitable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, well, I just kind of want to start out like I always do these. Um, just tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, going up, going through university, uh, and kind of how you got into poetry writing, and then we'll go on to fiction. Yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, I've always, I've always written stuff. Um, I liked. I think I was. It was easier for me to write stuff down than talk about things, um, which is how I first got into writing, and. I remember the point where I always wrote little short stories and things, but I remember the point when I thought, oh, I've just fallen in love with telling stories. And it's such a, a stereotypical nerdy thing to say, but it was when I read Lord of the Rings um, when I was about 15. Um, and my stuff is really different from Lord of the Rings, but for some reason it just triggered something in me and it made me far more interested in trying to talk to people emotionally through stories but also films as well because the films were coming out at the time and there was like a, a parallel between those so from about 15 16 I started to write a lot of drama a lot of terrible screenplays um a lot of theater um and then as I came into my 20s I did little bits and pieces um for certain societies and a few little freelance pieces of scripting but nothing really major and I was doing a lot of non-fiction writing as well um, because I was scared to do fiction I was I honestly thought there's no way I can talk about something for that long uh, have an idea that's good enough 
and I don't know like I just I, I didn't I didn't even know how to tackle it I'd not learned how to write I didn't English literature at university but that's reading it's not writing as such mm -hmm. um and then the poetry came in in about the mid mid 20s because I'm about uh, 35 now um because I it wasn't it wasn't even poetry it was the fact that I was looking for submissions and things I could just write and submit to. And um, I saw an open call for some poems about uh, yetis and witches and things. And I thought, oh, I didn't know you could write poems about weird things like that. I thought they were all just like, I love thee and so on. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so I thought, well, I'll just give it a try. And I saw it as more like writing a short story, if anything, a short story that fits on one page, but is told quite lyrically so you can be a bit fun with language and roll off sentences that sound kind of bizarre and obscure but sound nice when they kind of trickle off your tongue mm -hmm. and I just really enjoyed it and I seemed to get quite a lot of published and people liked them so I carried on um, and that's how I kind of became a poet um, which I was kind of mostly doing in my, my late 20s and I still do now um, I had a collection out last year um, and then from then I kind of built up the confidence, I guess, once I had a couple of collections out, um, I had an idea which turned into Composite Creatures, which ended up being my debut novel. Um, so that's kind of the, the wiggly route. Um, it took quite a while, but mainly that was just a confidence issue, I think, on my behalf. I gotcha. Um, yeah, because I can, I can see how, you know, it can be pretty difficult going from writing poetry to writing like long form, because, you know, you're like, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I mean, poetry is hard, I mean, trying to come up with the right words and going, you know, just does this, you know, do you get a feeling or an emotion from this or from these couple of sentences? And then going, yeah. okay, how can I, how in the world do I turn this into like two, three, four hundred oh, pages? <laughs> totally. Like, I wouldn't have a clue myself. <laughs> um, but I, th I think what happened in the end, actually, for Composite Creatures was that I'd been asked by it. A magazine in Edinburgh um, called Shoreline of Infinity, uh, which published a lot of um, science fiction, poetry and short stories and reviews and things. And they'd asked me to write a series of science fiction poems for an anthology. I think it was an international anthology that they were making just to see if I could get some in. So I did. I rattled them off and I was just in my living room and I was trying to base it on uh, <laughs> things in my living room um, because I like I quite like science fiction that feels very real and very possible that can happen. So I wrote one about um, air quality and people being responsible for having to grow lots of plants to kind of offset their own um, carbon. Um, I wrote one about an alternative form of taxes, which I'm not going to say too much about because I might do something about that. And then my cat walked in and I wrote one based on her and I sort of can't say too much about it because this is the poem that ended up being composite creatures and when I wrote it I just remember thinking um it there was something there there was I wrote it just from the point of view of a person in the situation and um I thought actually there's other characters there that could be pulled in and I thought what well, that could make a short story and then I started to try and do some sort of outline which is something I'd never done before and then I thought oh perhaps a novella and then as I kept outlining I thought maybe this one could be the one that I try and write as a novel and I did and then it ended up being Composite Creatures which is my first attempt at a novel um, so it kind of happened weirdly organically and then when I was outlining it it just seemed to fall into place um, I don't think that will happen with every book I write but something about that one just seemed to to slot in it was quite and I, I I blame the cat. It was all the cat's idea. <laughs> I was going to say, I was gonna say you know, unless like a different type of creature like walks into your living room and inspires you, I mean, it's, it's just going to be the cat. <laughs> I know, I know. And for people who haven't read the book, like there's not even, there's not a cat in it as such. Um, but if you read it, you might understand where the, the descriptions of my cat might come into it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what uh I guess what would you say are were the biggest hurdles going from poetry to to longshore fiction? I mean, I know, you know, outlining, which is something you've never done before, but you know, what yeah. did did you find any spots where you just were like, gosh, I don't know if I've got the motivation to continue or I don't yeah. really know where to go from here? I think 
I didn't lack the motivation to continue it as such. Um, where I felt like I really struggled and worried was one, I had no idea if it was even readable. Um, and I'd written the first draft in, I mean, the novel's been described in some ways as quite poetic. The descriptions are quite unusual, um, but it was even more so earlier on. And I think I really needed to tone that down. And I think it got to about the second draft, maybe the third. When I say second or third draft, that's kind of, it was very pure to the first draft. It was just me tweaking things and moving things around. I thought, I don't know where to go with this now because I'd reached the ends of my expertise mm. in how to craft a novel. I had no idea whether this read like a novel because um, I couldn't be that objective. I just, I needed someone to really help me to one, say if it's readable, two, how can I make it better? Is it boring? Is it, is it repetitive? You know, everything that you worry about. And at that point, um, I don't even think, I think my partner read it and I asked him to read it at the time, but you never know when it's someone you know, because they're, you know, are they just being nice? Um, <laughs> and, um, and also he, the thing with getting beta readers is you've got to find them in the right way. You've got to find people that like reading the sort of thing that you've written. And the only people I thought of at the time were people who like reading completely different sort of things to the sort of thing I wrote. So at that point I just went for it and I started to look for an agent um and submitted several pieces here there and everywhere and then um got one and he he's really helped me a lot to edit it from that point onwards so he was really helpful in helping me to tighten it and and just make it a little bit more commercial which I think is probably like a bit of a, a weird thing to say because not everybody wants to be more commercial but I think when you write quite weird things you need to make them at least a little bit commercial so that anybody would read it um so he's been great and since then on stuff i've worked on i've definitely developed having beta readers to help me with that um but generally about the poetry i was going to say this before but i forgot i think writing poems though it's a bit it sounds a bit oh um i think it's really good practice for anybody writing anything because it's almost like it can be like a novel condensed onto a page and trying to find exactly the right words which convey the right feeling or the right sound or and the thing about poetry is you have that you've got to avoid cliche entirely so you you know if, if a poem says you know it it was light as a feather that's not it's not great the point is to try and describe it in a different way an unusual way that nobody's ever done it before and that's really useful for writing prose because then you're already starting to think out of the box and thinking about different sensations and it's a bit like training um so i always try and encourage people to to have a go and even if they're not going to send it anywhere just just to kind of hone their skills a little bit help me it's kind, of, kind of practice a little bit Did it, do you feel like it uh it helped you write your synopsis like your back cover copy because I know I know a lot of authors they're like I can write the book but gosh I I can't do this <laughs> uh, well yeah I mean if you think about the there's like two synopsis this is the synopsis um isn't that because there's the one that you synops synopsi <laughs> I'm not sure um <laughs> It's like the one that you submit when they're trying to like get your book out there, which is like a summary of everything. And then there's like the blurb for the back of the book. And they are harder than writing the whole book because you think if I could summarize it in one page, I wouldn't have had to write, you know, 60,000 words, 70,000 right. words. Um, so I find that really hard. Definitely being able to condense stuff into poetry and short forms, even prose poetry, definitely helps definitely because you just learn that you can be a lot more economical with language but it's still really really hard I'd love to meet someone that said that's easy yeah <laughs> I, I think it's a I think it's a very small group of people that would say that's probably easy yeah probably. <laughs> um so you mentioned uh you know Tolkien which I, I'm just I'm gonna start making like a checklist like whenever I have these chats of like okay yeah. Tolkien's an influence and then this 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 but um you know, who would you say, I guess, were your major influences for poetry and then even your ones for your fiction writing? Yeah, so poetry, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite flaky in that I read stuff and then I think that's the best thing ever. And then I read someone else and I'm like, that's the best thing ever. Um, so I'm constantly trying different things across different types of poetry and fiction as well. 
but things that stick out in terms of um, poetry, it's an old one, but you know, Edgar Allan Poe, like I always come back to him, like the Raven, because it's creepy and it's dark, which I particularly like, but also there's something quite like, oh, or something kind of like delicious about the way that he uses descriptions. Like they're, it's very lyrical. It's almost like tongue twisters in many ways. Um, and actually a complete aside, I've been reading because of having a, a five-year-old, five-month-year-old, um, I've been reading a lot of Dr. Zeus <laughs> uh, to him, even though he has no idea what's going on. I'm enjoying right. it. And he is so surreal. And that's that's like really surreal poetry as well. And I, I really like it, like genuinely for myself. And in terms of fiction, um, again, I've always read really widely. Yes, told me. I wouldn't say I'm inspired by, like I kind of take on any of his style or anything particularly that he does, because mine's really, really different. But he just seemed to capture something. I, when I read it, it felt like it was real. And I think that's what brought it to life for me. Um, and as a teenager, I read a lot of um, a lot of fantasy and science fiction. You probably hear this one a lot as well, but Discworld was a, a massive influence. I don't hear it as much as you would think. Actually. Really? Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone would say Terry Pratchett, but yeah, I mean, God, I used to, I used to just chew those down. Um, and even younger than that, I used to read a lot of horror as well. In those days, it was like point horrors that you would get. Um, goosebumps before that as well. I just like, I've always liked things with a bit of a dark lilt to them. And even now I read a lot of, um, I read some like literary stuff as well, because I tend to try and read stuff from various um, prizes that's around just to see kind of like what, what's out there. And I like reading lots of different stuff. But everything I pick up always seems to end badly or have something horrible happen in it or there's, there's the, the main character is, is really incredibly flawed. And I think that's what I find interesting. It's it's not necessarily, I say this, but I'm, I'm sort of disagreeing with myself because I love those as well. But I'm most interested in stories where it, it's somebody massively flawed and they're in a situation where the reader or viewer is going to experience the bad consequences of this person's decisions. Um, but I'm also massive, I always say this, but I'm really um, inspired by film, actually, probably more than books, because um, I'm a very visual thinker. And even when I'm writing it, I I have to see it happening. I think that helps me with descriptions and things, but also voice, because I tend to do things in first person. Um, so there's almost like a narrator going on, but I see it through camera angles, even like dodgy camera angles and zoom in of people's face and everything like that. So quite often it'll be um, like the Black Mirror series and that's on Netflix. I find that very um, inspiring just because that captures the sort of incredibly real sense of science fiction of a very near future that's really relatable and you can picture yourself in it and as a result the consequences just feel so much worse because you think that could be me that could yeah. be me in 10 years or something so I guess my inspirations come from all over the place I don't <laughs> even know if I've narrowed anything down there just everything everything just, just a tree of influences and you're just yeah. picking, picking apples off of it <laughs> yeah so when people ask me I'm like Everything, everything, because I think you can learn from everything you read and everything you see, whether it's something that you like in it or something that you don't like in it. Um, and that's why reading and watching things and listening to even music, you know, it helps, it helps writers in lots of ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I need to, I don't know if I need to have like a round table discussion or I don't know, just find out what it is, but I feel like a lot of people in the, I'd say the past five years, it's probably been more, yeah. but um, the whole flawed characters, morally great characters, yeah. you know, you don't have just this gallant hero that has no flaws and is perfect. You, know, you, you don't see that as much nowadays. Everybody is flawed yeah. in some way. And I'm, and I'm curious as like, when did the shift happen? Why did the shift happen? And like, why is it that everybody is really looking for that nowadays? Because I guess a lot of authors are writing that nowadays. But yeah. what, do you, what do you think is like the reason? Do you know? Is it just the way we think nowadays? Like, okay, we're all flawed. So let's read about other flawed people. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. 
maybe it's with a lot of things kind of going wrong in the world as well like we're trying to understand why things have gone wrong and mm -hmm. you know if it's a a really positive hero who's who's this perfect alpha character who never seems to make mistakes that's not particularly relatable i guess um so maybe kind of boring this, a little bit a little he was like, bit. He was like, oh, he's he's going to go do the thing and it's going to be fun. Yeah, and you know it's going to be fine. But I like not knowing if it's going to be fine. And I, well, I'd probably be a much happier person if I read lots of things where everything was always fine at the end. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, I don't find that as interesting. And yeah, maybe it's something to do with that. Maybe it's something to do with the world being a bit of a crazy place at the moment. Um, we want to, we want to read something that feels the same and I don't know whether a lot of people feel like there's some sort of superhero going to come and rescue us all. Maybe it's down to us to fix everything. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, yeah it, you know, it's it's. Was, I, I like. I really like character studies. So, like, when yeah. when an author will write a book, and you know, they can have multiple characters or whatever, but um, being able to relate to that character and really like feel the way they're feeling, their emotions, their yeah. their motivations, you know, why in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, I kind of see why they did that now. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, or, gosh, that really doesn't make sense. I can't believe they did that. You know, it's kind of like being in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a horror movie or whatever, being in the yes. uh, sitting there yes. watching and going, no, 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 don't, don't, go, don't go in there. <laughs> exactly. Yes. I think I, well, that's partly why I'm always writing like first person. And they're always very complicated people because I think I'm a bit of an actor inside as well. I want to be in it. It's like playing a computer game or imagining yourself in a film it, it's it's being there part of it you're not just objective watching all these things unfold you're actually inside it and you understand the motivations even if you're you're reading it and you're thinking this person's motivations are very odd at least you understand them and then you you're thinking about it on another level because you're also questioning that person's choices and whether that person is even telling you the truth about what they're doing I kind of like that <laughs> I don't know what that says about me but I, I like that <laughs> yeah it's, you know you know going should I actually like this person or I know. yeah gosh because exactly. they seem very evil but like I kind of like I got it I kind of win it I kind of get it yeah <laughs> yeah because sometimes you know it's just a, a small series of bad decisions that make someone look like a terrible person but once you know it was just three or four things that they did and it's almost like a domino effect mm -hmm. that's that's really interesting because you think how are they going to pull from that they're not a terrible person they just look like one yeah so yeah i, I think that's cool yeah, yeah. You, know, you know wrong time wrong place you know yeah. put, put in the situation yeah. you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> um so i want to talk a little bit about uh composite creatures so um you talked a little bit already about kind of how where where the idea i guess started um you know with with your cat walking into the room and <laughs> yeah but um what um i guess what was the the overall inspiration for the story uh itself um you yeah. know I, I know i know where it started but like what i guess what kind of kept driving it yeah. so initially uh it changed a little bit during writing it so initially it was a little bit more about uh environmentalism i guess um, it it takes place in a world where um, it's it's like it's exactly the same as our world, but it's almost like several years, twenty years, maybe thirty years in the future, um, where things are just a little bit more polluted. So the air, uh, the soil, the sea, it's all contaminated with microplastics. Um, sky is like a funny shade of lilac. The soles in your shoes burn a little bit if you walk on soil for too long. Um, and it was kind of about our relationship to that and how we can become disconnected from it. Um, but as I was writing it, the, the main character, Nora, who it's told through her eyes, she, she still does acknowledge that, but the, the story seemed to go in a much darker way in terms of how one person might, when they're contaminated by the outside world, in terms of the, the the things that this pollution is doing to our physical bodies what she might do or what she might sign up to in order to counteract it but as i was writing it i kept my eye on kind of like um news as to what was going on in the world and recent scientific developments and things and oh it was horrible because at every turn i thought i'd created 
oh something that was awful or like oh that could never happen but it's within the realms of personality but maybe maybe that wouldn't happen I'd read about it in the news that people were doing it or there had been some research into it and I thought oh dear lord so um see in the end it ended up having a little bit of a, a body horror edge to it too just because I was trying to I was trying to freak people out as well. Um, so yeah, it, it sort of morphed a little bit, but in, in many ways it stayed true to its original form. And the fact that my cat walked in, she kept being a bit of an inspiration. Um, if anybody wants to see this cat, you know, who I keep talking about, if they just go on my Instagram, my Twitter, she is on there a lot. She's a mega giant cat. Um, because our relationship to animals in this world is, is, is broken because animals are also disappearing. The birds went first, which are, you know, to us are like a symbol of hope. You know, you look in the sky and you see lots of birds flying past and think, ah, but we don't get that anymore. And that has consequences on, on the world as it is. Like, and then it, I always think with animals, it's like what happens to animals is sort of a, uh, what's the word? Like, it's a bit of a, a sense of what might happen to us a little bit further down the road because we are also are animals as well and when you see these awful things happen to animals and the way that they might be manipulated as well um it just kind of gives you a little bit sense of foreboding as to what might happen to humans in the future and i was always wanting to write something that felt quite realistic and i think i did that i think i did it <laughs> Yeah, you know, first of all, it's freaking scary that you only did it like 20 or 30 years in the future because I'm sitting there going, oh gosh, if I can live through potentially this, this is awful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, what was, uh, I guess, not really the idea, but why did you, I guess, focus on hmm. the widespread like disappearance of animals uh, throughout your story? Because, um, yeah. I mean, you know, you know you read a lot of dystopian stuff and like animals like they really aren't a focus I mean you know you focus on just the human relationship and the fall of man uh and then you know you might have like a rabid wolf or something every now and then you're just kind of being an obstacle but you know you're I mean from the very beginning of composite creatures I mean it's like a focus uh because even uh the story that you know Nora and her mother you know sitting talking about birds and she's like I can't picture it and I don't know I don't know what it looks like um, so what was what was the I guess the the meaning behind the focus? I guess I guess it was a few things. So it it almost made me think of the dinosaurs in respect to what what killed off all the dinosaurs was uh, you know a natural disaster, and what's made these animals disappear is also a natural disaster of sorts, but it's man made, so it, it's our own fault, but. Also, I don't think we realize, but when we look in the environment or say we go for a walk in the woods or we go to the beach or anywhere, it's animals that sort of bring the environment to life for us. If you can imagine doing any of those things and not imagining that you'll hear birds in the trees or see any kind of tracks of you know hedgehogs or foxes or anything like that. It's a bit scary. And I don't know if you remember years ago, like whenever there's an eclipse or something and the birds go weirdly quiet, it's quite eerie and unnatural. And I just wanted to demonstrate the route into a very unnatural world that's been caused by man's manipulations of the environment. Um, and as I said before, whatever happens to animals will happen to us as well eventually. So it's almost like watching your own downfall in a way but yeah the way it affects people is you know they go out they go walking they go they're trying to escape cities to these green spaces or you know in the UK like a ruined castle or something and it's it's kind of dead there's there's it's uninhabitable the grass has gone gold because it's yellow um and dying and nothing can live there and even we can't stay there for very long so I guess it was to kind of add a sense of dread in but also it's again it's relatable because every day there's new species of animals in the wild which are becoming extinct even ones that we've, we've never even like discovered yet they're all becoming extinct um so again it's to be quite realistic because unfortunately i didn't really intend it to be that way but unfortunately it's like kind of a, a really possible thing that can happen in our future um 
Yeah. I mean, omen of doom, basically. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I don't. You don't really think about it that much, but yeah, it would be really weird to like walk outside and not hear yeah, it, a single yeah. bird. No, it would just be. And if there wasn't any cars, it would just be like a dead landscape, like Mad Max kind of thing going on. There's just mm-hmm. there's just nothing there, and it, we don't realize, but it is. It's all these little movements and little sounds in nature that make it alive. And without those, it would be. It would be eerie and creepy, creepy as hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of, it kind of it makes you think of the movie I Am Legend, you know, where he's just yeah. like walking down the middle, you know, of yeah. the city and there's just nothing. And then like randomly, yeah. there's a deer, you know, yeah. uh, just like running like, across. I'm like, yeah. that would scare the crap out of me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely, exactly. So in the book, um, one of the things that the, the government and corporations are trying to do is trying to reinvigorate a little bit of that and create artificial animals in some respect more in a lot of cases it's for just decoration and just to make people feel better like fish in a fish tank or the odd bird or something so there's like a description very near the beginning of a a cuckoo or what's meant to be a cuckoo in a tree but Nora's mother who is from an age where there was birds can tell the difference whereas people now can't Mm -hmm. um and it's it's kind of just a demonstration of how generations change and how we're losing things all the time that they're, they're just going and they're part of history and we don't we don't even realize but yeah yeah <laughs> yeah was, you know uh, i think it's i think it's blake crouch's wayward pines books okay. um where you know civilization's pretty much over and they've got like this one place like in the mountains and i i think it's those books where they're like pumping in artificial like bird noises to like yeah. get the feel, you know, that yeah. it's not just humans, you know, left or whatever. Um, yeah. so I kind of I got that sense that, you know, you're just, you're just sitting there, you're looking around and you're like, okay, it sounds like reality. <laughs> Does it yeah. look like reality? No. <laughs> no, it's just an attempt to calm people, isn't it? Because a lot of these like bird songs and ocean noises, even now, like, you know, when years ago you could buy like cds with that on to try and relax too because it's meant to chill it's meant to chill you but if we don't have those options anymore it's just us it's just us left that's quite frightening it is yeah. gosh i need to go yeah. fucking need to go like get up under a blanket <laughs> just like sorry. self-soothe for a little bit <laughs> i know sorry nobody feel, seems very happy it, after they've talked to me uh, for a while ultra dread. <laughs> <laughs> um Tell me a little bit about Bookish Take. I was going to talk to Gabrielle yeah. Houston about it uh, when we chatted last, but tell me a little bit about what it is, uh, what y'all yeah. are doing with it, and then I guess what to expect going forward. Yeah, so at the moment, it's a, a short series of um, on YouTube called Bookish Take, um, and it's run by me and my fellow Angry Robot author, uh, Gabrielle Houston, who wrote The Second Bell. Um, and we basically create videos, which are kind of like 20 minutes, sometimes a little bit shorter, sometimes longer, about being a writer and our processes for how to write books. So the first series kind of concentrated on things from the initial idea, how we came up with our initial ideas, to how we wrote first drafts and editing and, and, and so on, and how we found our agents and publishers. Um, and then since then, we've done some more um, where we're interviewing people. So we've interviewed an agent. It was Gabriella's agent. Um, we're going to interview uh, some publishers um, and various of that kind of insider people in the book trade just to help what's well, to help writers who might not have got to that point yet kind of get some tips maybe for might help them if, or just even to just have a bit of sense of camaraderie so that we when we're all in it together um but yeah so it's an ongoing youtube series and it's great fun like it's really good and honestly we have to sometimes like stop because we're just we're just like we talk too much <laughs> um but yeah people should give them a listen just dip into like one or two and, and see what you think and if anyone's got any ideas for any things that they'd like us to to talk about or people for us to interview just let us know and we'll get in touch with them and see if you want to do it that's awesome. You could come on. <laughs> hey, that'd be great. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I just, I love, I love seeing when people kind of do doing something new to, to help oh. everybody. Cause you know, that, that's kind of the reason we do the blog is, is to, to help, 
you know, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll read books and review books by authors that are pretty well known, but we'll also do a lot of, you know, debuts, um, yeah. you know, indie authors, self-published authors, stuff like that, just to, just to help boost them a little bit. So it's always awesome to see authors even uh, taking, you know, taking a chance to go, okay, how can I help out in the community do, you know, do something. So that's, that's really great. I'll make sure to, uh, to, to pin that here and, uh, and talk about it. Um, now, that, now that I know about it, that's awesome. Um, so what, uh, what are you working on now? So I'm working on a new novel, um, which I started writing last year um, during lockdown here in the UK, um, which was weird because at first, I think everyone pretty much struggled to write anything. But then as the year got on, um, it sort of became a bit of a refuge in a way, like it was a really good thing for me to do to see through. I took a little bit of a hiatus when um, the baby was born in January, but I've picked it up now um, from last month. So hoping to finish that this year and then we'll see where it goes. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit different to composite creatures. It's still, um, it's still speculative, uh, science fiction, but it's a little bit more, genre bending <laughs> um, which could be an issue but we will see and um, but if it's surreal as well and it kind of looks at um time a little bit but also i guess how far we'll go to belong somewhere and to find where we belong but again it's it's from a, a character's perspective who has who has flaws but he's very much on a quest this guy and it's it's exciting to see where he's going to end up in a weird place, no doubt. <laughs> <But yeah. laughs> um, yeah. How how is it? You know, have you found writing now that you have a little creature in your house? <laughs> is that what, is what I'm just saying? Um, yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Um, you know, versus how it was, I guess, prior prior to having your son. It's you know, hard. How, yeah. It, yeah, it's a lot harder. But I mean, it's very early days. But before, um, I've always had. I've always had a good level of focus with it because I've known, I've known personally that if I don't do something every day, I really struggle to keep things up. And it's not just for motivation purposes. It's, it's like you have to keep it alive in your head a bit, especially with writing a novel. I feel like I have to keep everybody, all the characters talking and all this, the cogs turning. Mm -hmm. And if that stops, when I go back to it, I kind of see it a different way and I might want to change stuff. I need to keep it going to keep like that vision pure. So um, now that I've picked it up, I have to keep going. And I'm just basically trying to do some every day. It's evenings um, once he's asleep. Um, and my mind is quite often mush at that point, which isn't good because this is a very complicated book. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. And every day I do it, it's a little bit easier. But I have so much respect for, for writers. And there are lots of them who write with, you know, two kids, three kids, more and, and they work and and everything else like they, they, they're amazing and I just hope I can be one of those as well and so far so far so good um I'm getting a lot of people telling me calm down <laughs> take your time but I feel like I'm ready personally to to dip my head back in this story because it's one that I really do care about and I want to see where he goes um and then I've got ideas for other things afterwards and I don't want to do those until I've done this one so yeah so yeah it's hard but it's going basically. Yeah, it's hard, it's yeah. hard but but doable. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You've just you've just got to be, you've just got to make yourself do it a little bit every day and take the chances. I've had a lot of people telling me, oh well, when the baby naps, but this baby don't nap, so um, he he sleeps at night, so that's good. Um, so once he's in bed in the evening, that's when I try and uh, dip my head in, and at the moment, kind of doing editing on that. So yeah, Good and then I can have a chill afterwards. Yeah. 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 It's like, you know, when, when my daughter naps, I was like, yeah. well, I, I could write or I could get work done or I could wash clothes or I could do dishes or I could yeah. thank you. Okay. Yeah. I have way too many things that I need to do. <laughs> I, I was like, I, I was like, you know, I was like, I'm not contracted to do anything. And <laughs> yeah. I know you just go into the toilet, like, you know, just like basic bodily things. That you've got to do. Take, take a shower. <laughs> yeah. Take a shower, brush your teeth, like anything, anything at all. Um, but yeah, it's hard, but lots of people do it. Lots of people don't do it too. Lots of people just decide to have up. No, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. 
it's yeah, I, I feel like I feel like it's a special type of motivation to to really kind of push yourself to do it. Because I mean, you know, you spend all day with your child, and then you're like, okay, they're finally in bed. Oh, it's time to veg and breathe, oh. and maybe watch a little bit of television, or maybe do a little bit of reading or something. But like, yeah. it's almost like going to your next job. You know, getting back to writing sometimes. So I, I feel like that's why a lot of people are kind of like, I'm going to shelve, you know, shelve it for now. Okay. Yeah, and I wouldn't blame them either. I wouldn't blame them, but I feel like I personally can't stop. And I, when I do stop, which I did for the first three, four months um, with Noah, um, I felt weird. Like I've realized in the past when I'm not doing something like this, writing some novel or writing poetry, or I've written um, libretto for music as well before. If I'm not doing something, I think I it it all kind of clams up a little bit and I don't worry about myself or anything I just think it's like a really good outlet uh, and it lets me be me for a while in a world where you've got to play lots of different characters when you're at work when you're at the shops and things um it's a good release yeah for sure um anything that you've been able to read recently that you'd recommend uh yeah well dr seuss (laughs) Uh, (laughs) oh always dr seuss (laughs) yeah they're they're very quick and easy um lots of nice pictures as well um but otherwise yeah there's a couple of things so i recently read um skyward in by alia whiteley um i'm a huge fan of hers she is she's brilliant she if, if you i don't know if you've read anything by her but she does like um Again, it's quite genre bending, so it's a bit fantastical, fantastical, a little bit science fiction, but they're very weird and creepy. Um, and yeah, and they go off in very dark directions. And Scattered In was one, her latest book. I really recommend it. And and before that, I read um, The Mermaid of Black Conch um, okay. by Rothy, which is like a take on an old folkloric tale about mermaids in the caribbean but again it's like it's really realistic and you could almost imagine it happening it was amazing and the way she's written it she's kind of got a little bit of poetry in there too because whenever certain characters speak they speak in different ways and one of them speaks in like a kind of weird verse kind of thing um and i don't know there was something about the voices it was just you could hear them in your head it was amazing so I really, and I think it's won loads of prizes, that one. I think it won like the Costa book last year um, and something else as well. I think it's a Goldsmith prize or something. But, uh, but yeah, I really, really recommend it. Uh, so those are my two and, and Dr. Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I gotcha. Um, well, can I, I see you got a copy of uh, Comp- Composite Creatures up above you. Could you show oh, everybody? Yeah. I can, yeah. Usually when I the do beautiful this, everything cover. falls down. Um, but I yeah, mean, there it is. Yeah. This is the book, yeah. Awesome. So uh, Composite Creatures is available everywhere. So make sure to go get yourself a copy and, and check it out. Um, and uh, Caroline, thank you so much for, for coming and chatting this morning. I know uh, I know our schedules don't always allow for, for time to just relax and chat, but no. uh, it, it's always nice to be able to just kind of relax for a few minutes. I know, it's been lovely. <laughs> absolutely well um best of luck with your next novel um best of luck getting to the walking stage with your son uh it 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 is a lot of fun i promise it's a lot but it's a lot of fun it better be (laughs) and if you if you need if you need any tips give me give me a shout um and uh we'll try to do this again sometime yeah that'd be brilliant thank you awesome have a great rest of your week you too bye